When the RMS Titanic sank on the 15th of April 1912, claiming over 1,500 lives, she took with her the pride and dreams of a city. What took just 180 minutes to disappear had taken the people of Belfast millions of man hours to build. Before construction could begin, they'd had to carve a vast new dock from the city's marshland. They'd shaped acres of steel to form a hull that they believed was unsinkable. They'd installed two engines, each the size of a two-story building, to power the Titanic across the Atlantic. And their finest craftsmen had toiled to create an interior that rivaled the grandest hotels in Europe. Today, the place from which the great ship was launched is derelict and deserted. But our investigators have come here to build a picture of how it looked in its heyday. Home to an army of dedicated workers, the largest shipyard in the world. We'll find traces of the massive structures that once stood here, and the vast resources that were deployed. We'll discover the harsh conditions in which the men lived and worked, and reveal evidence of skill, determination, and extraordinary ambition. It ended in catastrophe, but what happened here was remarkable. We will reconstruct the world of the men who set out to build the biggest ship in history. This is the lost world of the Titanic. The Titanic was built here, in the Harland and Wolfe shipyard in Belfast, Northern Ireland. At the time, Belfast was one of the busiest ports in the world, handling goods from across the British Empire. But the port of Belfast hadn't always looked like this. At one time, the city didn't have a natural harbour big enough to accommodate a ship like the Titanic. Our investigators, marine engineer Rupert Kayser and historian Jennifer Regan, have come to find out how and why this land was transformed from a muddy swamp into one of the world's largest, busiest ports. They want to build a picture of the world that created the Titanic. Jennifer Regan from Georgetown University is an expert in early 20th century history. As a social historian, she wants to investigate the people, the city, and the shipyard that built the Titanic. Jennifer begins here, in the now derelict former headquarters of Harland and Wolfe, the company that built the ship. We all know that the sinking of the Titanic was probably the greatest maritime disaster of all history. But I'm interested in a different story about the Titanic, the lost world behind the Titanic. I've come to learn about the shipyards, the workers, and I want to know first, where did the idea come from? Why did Harland and Wolf, here in Belfast, decide to build the largest ship that man had ever seen? The early 20th century was a time of innovation and invention on land and sea. A new generation of steamships had begun a revolution in global travel. A company called the Cunard Line led the field with two super-fast vessels, the Mauritania and the Lusitania. Harland and Wolfe's chairman, William Peary, was determined to challenge this supremacy. He planned the construction of three vast new vessels for the White Star Line. One of them would be called the Titanic. These ocean liners had to be built by hand, without any of the modern tools and technology that we take for granted today. As an expert in marine engineering, Rupert Kayser is fascinated by the question of how it was done. On the 31st of May, 1911, the Royal Mail ship Titanic was launched from this slipway. Now, it wasn't her technology that really set her apart, it was her immense scale. Now, what I'm interested in finding out is what were the feats of engineering and the challenges that had to be overcome in order to create the largest ship in the world. The scale of William Pirrie's ambition becomes clear when we look at the blueprints for the Titanic. His ship would be 883 feet long, 90 feet longer than Cunard's Lusitania and Mauritania. The Titanic could carry almost 3,500 passengers and crew. 
there would be nine decks, and fully laden, she would weigh 67,000 tons. She would be the heaviest, tallest, grandest ship afloat. Five years before she sailed, the design process began here, in the Harland and Wolfe drawing office. Hidden away in a storeroom, Jennifer discovers the original plans for the ship. What I'm looking at are these plans which date from the exact same time period as the Titanic. And they're beautiful, they're hand-drawn, and this is not real, actual paper, it's actually linen. And what I've realized is that every single detail on the Titanic was drawn up in this room, from the decks to the doorknobs. It would have been decided here. And this huge room would have been full of people working away, draftsmen and architects. A small army of designers was mobilized to work here. Jennifer meets Una Riley from the Belfast Titanic Society to discover how it all came about. Una, looking at this model of the ship, how did this happen? Why did they decide to build a ship on this scale, so well, big? It's basically all down to one man, William Perry. He was chairman of Harland and Wolfe mm -hmm. at that time. He was very keen to uh, promote Belfast and to get work in to Belfast in the shipyard. Mm -hmm. And at that time, uh, the, the, the modern ship was the Cunarders, uh, the Lusitania and the Mauritania, mm -hmm. and they were built to race across the Atlantic to save time. Mm -hmm. Now, Perry decided, no, I'm not going to go for that market. Right. The Americas are opening up. There's immigrants want to go there. I'm going to build the biggest, most luxurious ships in the world mm -hmm. to attract the millionaires, and we're going to fill the, the, the other spaces with immigrants. Perry's concept was that the Titanic would make money not only from the very rich, but also from large numbers of third-class passengers who were travelling to America to begin a new life. Most of the space was given over to the first and second class, mm -hmm. but most of the people were actually down in the bowels of the ship in third class. This was to be the most prestigious shipbuilding project in history, completed in the world's largest shipyard. The creation of that shipyard was an engineering feat in itself. The city of Belfast grew from a small 17th century town on the River Lagan. The landscape has changed dramatically. To discover how, Rupert Kayser has come to meet local historian Stephen Cameron. Can you explain to us what this area would have looked like about 300 years ago? Yeah, I mean, really the way the river flowed down, this whole area would have been mud flats at the time. The river meandered very badly. It was a major problem for Belfast. Ships had to discharge cargoes uh, outside, uh, really, the, the confines of the river because it was so, so narrow and so shallow as well. So the Belfast Ballast Board decided that they would try and straighten the lagging, uh, and especially the bit uh, just behind us here. The port authorities were proposing a mammoth undertaking. Rupert wants to find out exactly how they plan to transform acres of mudflats into a thriving deep water harbour. He visits Jonathan King, historian of the Belfast Harbour Commissioners. My shipbuilding has started in Belfast in, in the 1790s. Jonathan is able to show Rupert the original plans for the harbour's development. It's hard to imagine, but the port actually starts here. Um, river Fawcett used to flow down Belfast's High Street into the River Lagan, and that's where the first wharf was built back in 1613. Now back then, none of this land existed. So all this area here was sort of like mud flats at low tides. All mud flats, all, all sandbanks. Um, I'm not much used to, to man or beast. Using Jonathan's maps as a starting point, we can see how dramatically the coastline has been altered. The harbour authorities cut a straight channel from the town to the sea. The mud and materials they dredged out were used to create all of this land. The Titanic would be built on a 17-acre artificial island known as Queen's Island. What I find particularly amazing, and I think what a lot of people to this day find staggering is that it, in the middle of the 19th century, how on earth could you have created such a huge area of industrial land without the use of the big machines we have today? Yes, yeah, so it was a huge undertaking. You have to imagine men with spades in the mud and the sleet digging this out physically. It was back-breaking, dirty, hard work, but it was a 
wonderful benefit because it gave Belfast the land and the space it needed to become the shipbuilders to the world. By 1909, Belfast City Harbour and dockyards covered a vast area. The workers believed that their shipyards were the best in the world. They were ready to begin building the Titanic. Unable to imagine the tragic end to which this enterprise was destined, they set about turning William Pirrie's dream into a reality. Our investigators are in Belfast, Northern Ireland, in search of the world that produced the Titanic. In the years before the ship's construction, a vast, deep harbour had been created to accommodate large, ocean-going vessels. But nothing on the scale of the Titanic had ever been built there. Before construction could begin, they had to create a yard capable of handling the job. A gigantic steel frame called a gantry was used to house the hull as it grew. It became known as the Great Gantry. Historian Jennifer Regan has come to see what's left of the shipyard with Una Riley of the Belfast Titanic Society. So Una, we've left Harland and Wolf headquarters and that's where the idea happened. And that's where the plans are drawn. And then this is where the construction happens. Yes. Right? Where are we? We're actually standing on the slipway where the Titanic was built. It was actually built in that area there. The great gantry that surrounded her was over 840 feet long and more than 200 feet tall. It towered above the shipyard. Today, only traces of this massive structure remain. And you can see the stumps of the gantries uh, over here. These metal bits these sticking metal, out here. These metal bits. Now, metal bits. That, and they would have risen hundreds of feet in the air. So this, this area we're standing on right now, which is I mean, it's kind of a wasteland in a way. It is, it is. This would have been all structures, and this would have been hundreds of people. Yes, I mean, this would have been an until of activity. There would have been men scurrying about uh, on top of these huge big gantries, uh, working cranes, riveting. So this would have been an incredibly noisy, dangerous area. The Great Gantry dominated the Belfast skyline for six decades. It had 16 movable cranes, lifts and walkways, and weighed over 6,000 tons. Rupert Kayser has come to talk to a man who once worked beneath it, former ship worker George McAllister. It must have been a, a very awe-inspiring sight for people who come here for the first time and see this colossal great latticework of metal and these two ships uh, forming underneath it. Well, I came in here as a 16-year-old boy and I was amazed at the noise and the number of people, the number of men working in this particular area here alone. The deafening clamour of shipbuilding would have echoed across the city. That is the first thing any visitor would hear was the noise of the plates being hammered and the riveting. The riveters were riveting all day long with hammers, just hammering on a steel box. Those boys came out stone deaf. There's no doubt they, they came out stone deaf. They had no ear protection or No ear protections, like no safety boots, safety toe cap boots, no gloves, no helmet, nothing whatsoever. Shipbuilding was the city's main industry. The majority of the workforce came from the Protestant community of East Belfast. Jennifer and Una are exploring the network of streets that once housed the workers who built the Titanic. So, Una, you know, this is a typical street that the thousands of Harland and Wolf workers would have worked on. Very, sorry, would have lived in. Yes, very much so. It's a typical terror street, and the workmen would have lived in these houses. Mm -hmm. The terraced houses were heated by coal fires and lit by candlelight. They had no internal plumbing. Although each was comprised of only four rooms, they often housed large families. You would be surprised at how big of a family could, mm -hmm. be, could be living in there. As many as six children, if not more. Wow. And there are thousands of people who are working for Harland and Wolf who are living on streets that are almost identical to this one. Yes, very yeah. much so. The construction of the Titanic and her sister ships created an unprecedented employment boom. As well as new houses, shops, schools and churches were also built. Across the city there was a flurry of building to accommodate the new ship workers and their families. Today many of the houses have been renovated. 
but hidden among the streets are clues to what life was like a hundred years ago. Una, looking at this photograph of Belfast in the early 1900s, the street we're standing on now has a lot of the original features. It has indeed. It has got uh, the original cobbles, and not only that, but the, the lampposts. The lampposts are beautiful. Absolutely. They would have been uh, the original gas lamps, mm -hmm. and uh, they're absolutely wonderful that they're still here. So this is very close to what a street would have looked like when Harland and Wolf was at its busiest. Yes, very much so. If you were to take away just the, um, these posts taking the electricity in and just have the lamppost, you could be standing on a, a street where Titanic workers were in practically every one of those houses. Today, the shipyard is no longer Belfast's main employer. Other industries have taken over. But in the early 1900s, it dominated every aspect of the workers' lives. Walking around these streets of East Belfast, I come to appreciate that these workers always lived in the shadow of the shipyard. You could actually see Harland and Wolf from where they live. They, all the workers would have walked or taken the tram there together. They lived in very close quarters in these terrace houses. And it gives you a sense of the tight-knit community and how important the shipyard was in their lives. By 1910, Harlan and Wolfe were employing 15,000 workers to build the Titanic alongside her sister ship, the Olympic. They used traditional methods. First, the keel was laid. Then a frame was built on top of it. The frame was then clad in a steel shell. Tens of thousands of tons of steel were poured, rolled and shaped. They were cut on site into plates six feet by 30 feet and then delivered to the gantry along a network of railway tracks. When the plates were in position, construction would begin. The shipyard is littered with the relics of this process. Looking for clues, you're asking for clues. Let's have a look in here. This will dig this up and we'll see. Here we are. Here we're getting pieces here, look, see. There, there's a piece of a rivet. Interesting, that is. There's another, there's another little piece of a head of a rivet. And here's, here's nuts and bolts, a plate washer on the temporary nut. And is it likely that, uh, that any of these items could have been used to build the Olympic and Titanic? Well, this is a slipway that the Titanic came off. I cannot guarantee you that they came off Titanic, but one never knows. Sure. Over three million of these rivets were used to hold the plates on the Titanic's hull together. Further clues can be found in the maze of railway tracks, which enabled an army of 50 small cranes to travel around the shipyard. Three of these cranes still stand. They were powered by steam. Yeah, that was... Three cranes are the last of the steam cranes that's left here in Harlands. They were here at the time of Titanic. They helped to build Titanic. When George McAllister worked here in the 1970s, he operated a crane just like this one. And that's the old boiler behind you there, but that's made the steam. And he operated these levers for loading the jib. These cranes were the workhorses of the shipyard. Able to lift five tons, they were extremely reliable. The simplicity of their design meant they remained in service for decades. It's amazing to think that these cranes, you know, once helped build this legendary vessel and they're just sitting here, rotting away. It wasn't just the machinery that had to be resilient. For the men building the Titanic, conditions were harsh. Well, when the shipyard first started, when it first opened in the 1800s, the men worked from 6 o'clock in the morning to 8.15 at night, five days a week. It's 14 and, hours a day. And from 8 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday to 4 p.m. It was a dangerous job to be done. There was lots of injuries, yeah. such as if it's a riveting flying off boats, maybe falling off the top of the ship. Men working down below. Well, you just had to carry. In those days, they were glad of a wage, so they just had to carry on with it. 
Harlan and Wolf were tough employers. The shipyard workers had very few rights. Men lined up every day trying to get a day's work. And in fact, uh, if you, were, you got a day's work, you used one of these little boards, which is a little wooden board, and it has a unique number stamped in there. 35315. Right. Okay. Uh, and that number would have entitled you to, to uh, this little board entitled you to many things. Even the, the permission to go to the toilet. You, had, right? to you had to use that. And you were only allowed seven minutes all day in the toilet. Thousands of skilled craftsmen with hundreds of different trades worked in the shipyards. From riveters, steel workers, fitters and joiners, to plumbers, cabinet makers, painters and plasterers. I mean, it was a whole world of industry. Thousands Just of people. Thousands of people, uh, all working together to produce magnificent ships. So what you're describing is not just the building of a ship, but it's the building of a city around this shipyard. It was like a city, and they did look after their citizens. Yes, they were tough employers, but there was respect there. Mm -hmm. It was tough, mm -hmm. and the men were tough, but they produced some fantastic ships. It took 15,000 men, 24,000 tons of steel, 3 million rivets, and two years of work. Finally, the hull was ready to be launched. Next, our investigators try to recapture the moment in May 1911 when the Titanic first entered the water. You could have got a leg broke. People could have been killed, which they were. Our investigators have explored the transformation of the Harland and Wolf shipyard to enable the building of the Titanic. After two years of intense labor by thousands of men, the ship's hull was complete. The next stage, before work could continue, was the launch. It was a moment of celebration and great anxiety. Una Riley tells Jennifer what happened. Una, tell me about the day of the launch, because we know that some 10,000 people showed up here, but actually they were just launching the outer shell of the boat, right? That's true. Um, the, the, the ship was built here, basically the hull, and it was into these waters here the Titanic would be launched on that day, 31st of May 1911. The hull's huge weight rested on rows of wooden supports called pit props. Before the ship could enter the water, these props had to be knocked away by hand. To find out more about this highly dangerous procedure, Rupert Kayser returns to the Titanic slipway with George McAllister. Now, she's a larger ship in the world. It must have been an extremely dangerous time with this huge vessel towering above and knocking away all the wooden supports. I mean, was it really that dangerous? Yes, it was very dangerous because those pit props, as we call them, were flying everywhere. Right. So you could have got a leg broke. People could have been killed, which they were. Were they flexing under the weight? Well, as they got so many out, the ship was coming down onto the rest that was left there, and they were actually bowing out, and they just shot out at a tremendous force. Shot out? Shot out, shot out anywhere. Just after midday on the 31st of May, 1911, after final checks and on a signal from Lord Peary, the Harland and Wolf chairman, the launch began. It was a dramatic moment. The Titanic was in motion for the first time. It took just 62 seconds for the 24,000 ton hull to slide down the slipway and into the river Lagan. For the watching people of Belfast, it was a moment to save her. But it came at a cost. One of the team assigned to remove the pit props was crushed and killed by falling timber. The Titanic had claimed a life before she'd even entered the water. After the launch, work began immediately to complete the ship. Huge steel anchors and four mighty funnels were installed. Only three of the funnels had any practical purpose. The fourth was there to make the Titanic look more impressive than her rivals. Two massive steam engines would power her across the Atlantic. They were fed by 29 boilers and 159 furnaces. When the Titanic sailed, 160 firemen would stoke them with over 600 tons of coal per day. The two engines each stood over 30 feet high. At the time, 
They were the largest ever built. Their design was very similar to these smaller engines in London's Kew Bridge Steam Museum. Rupert has come here to see the engines in action and find out from steam engineer Dick Fillery what it would have been like in the Titanic's engine room. This engine here is, in fact, quite a small triple expansion engine. The engines in the Titanic would have been what, five times the length, four times as high. Uh, instead of just one walkway round it like this, there'd have been three or four walkways going up right up the very top of the engine. And apart from that, it had been dark and gloomy inside the border rooms. They didn't have lots and lots of light going, so this thing would tower up into the darkness and make it be even bigger than it appeared. And of course, the engine would be turning round, and in fact, the whole ship would shake as the engine was turning. So some people found it quite a scary place to have been. The design of the Titanic's engines was comparatively old-fashioned. While the rival Cunard line had fitted its ships with turbines, the Titanic's designers put their faith in a traditional, reciprocating design. So why was an engine of this type used to propel the Titanic? They were efficient, they used less fuel than a simple engine, and also they were well-tried technology. They'd been built for years, people knew how to put them together properly, people knew how to run them properly, and they were reliable. And that was what a shipping company likes. The Titanic did, however, have an auxiliary turbine engine powered by the exhaust gases of her two main engines. This drove a central four-bladed propeller. That's a little strange because at the time, ships had either reciprocating yeah. engines yeah. Or, or turbine engines. Yeah. Why, why the combination? If it's going for efficiency, one of the things you've, you've got to do, once you get in the ship, you've got to carry your fuel with you. So the less fuel you can carry, the more passengers, cargo, or whatever you can carry in a boat. With her engines fitted, the Titanic needed to be moved from the water into a dry dock, where final work on the hull could be completed. The only dock big enough to accommodate her was the Thompson Dry Dock. Rupert has come here to meet naval historian John Beatty from the Belfast Science Park. This really is quite an extraordinary sight. Absolutely colossal size. It really does take your breath away. It's fantastic to look at. Yes, indeed, the dock was totally filled by the Titanic. This was the largest dry dock of its time, 850 feet long and 120 feet deep. To build a dry dock on this scale was an impressive feat of engineering in itself. Well, there really must have been some huge undertaking to create a dock of this size, especially 100 years ago. Yes, indeed. They knew at the outset that they had a, a very big challenge to build this dock, as they were building through very poor material. Approximately 50 foot of reclaimed land, which is basically mud. And indeed, the dock itself, hidden where you cannot see, there's an enormous amount of materials used in the dock. Uh, absolutely stupendous amount of concrete and brick. So it really was a colossal engineering feat. It was, and a high risk, a high risk piece of engineering. Construction of the dry dock was meant to take just three and a half years, but it took twice that long. It was ready just in time for the Titanic. On the 3rd of February, 1912, tugboats began the delicate process of manoeuvring the Titanic safely into the Thompson dry dock. When she was inside, the gates were closed and engines from the nearby pump house began to drain the water out. In the case of the Thompson dock, it's 23 million imperial gallons of water have to be taken out to dry the dock. 23 million. 23 million, and these pumps could pump all that water out in one hour, 40 minutes. But in real terms, they would be more careful in how they pumped the water out because they had to allow the ship to, to settle onto the keel blocks. In the Titanic's case, pumping lasted 12 hours. The operation was made more complicated because of the extraordinary length of the Titanic and the extreme value of the vessel. They were extremely careful that the 55 odd thousand tons would settle precisely on the keel blocks. They didn't want to take any chance that they would damage the vessel as they bedded it down and drive it out. 
The final stages of construction could now safely take place, fitting her mighty three-blade propellers, wiring the ship's state-of-the-art electrical systems, and finally, painting her hull. By March 1912, the main structural and engineering work was complete. The next challenge was to fit the interior of the Titanic and transform her into the most lavish and elegant vessel afloat. What I want to know next is how the interior of the ship was built. Harland and Wolf did not spare any money. They brought in thousands of master craftsmen to construct the most luxurious interior of the Titanic. So what I want to do is to go into the world of those master craftsmen and understand how they worked. Historian Jennifer Regan has come to Belfast City Hall to meet Una Riley. This building was opened in 1906, just one year before the Titanic was commissioned. It's a fabulous example of the ambitious design and expert craftsmanship that went into the Titanic. The ornate wood panelling, decorated ceilings and fixtures and fittings were the finest of their time. Many of the craftsmen and artisans who worked here later created the interior of the Titanic. Now, I've heard that the City Hall is actually called the Stone Titanic locally. Why is that? That is true, because uh, it was conceived around the same time as uh, the Titanic was being conceived, and uh, Lord Perry, who had been a former Lord Mayor, he was involved with the construction and design of this, and it's felt that he took some of the, the designs from here to the Titanic. What I love about this room is all the period detailing because it was built just six years before the Titanic. So it's really the same kind of period in design. And there's so much detail in the ceiling, in all this cornicing, in these columns. You've got the stained glass windows. They're yes, beautiful. Absolutely. I mean, they didn't do things by half in Belfast at the beginning of the, the 20th century. Everything was done to, uh, to the best, to the highest, to the best specification, just like Titanic. The first-class accommodation rivaled the grandest hotel on land. Its centerpiece was the elegant sweeping staircase that led from the promenade deck to the vast panel dining room. In order to recreate the sumptuous luxury of the Titanic's interior, Jennifer has traveled from Belfast to Northumberland. Here, in the ancient town of Annick, she has uncovered a replica of the Titanic's first-class dining room. When the White Swan Hotel was refurbished in 1936, interior fittings and furnishings from the Titanic's sister ship, Olympic, were used. The Olympic's interiors were identical to those on the Titanic. The ships were designed and built by the same Belfast craftsmen. In the lobby of the hotel is the last remaining section of the grand staircase from the first class saloon. So, John, what can you tell me about this magnificent carved staircase? Wonderful example. This is the last surviving part of the grand staircase from RMS Olympic, identical to what was on RMS Titanic in 1912 when she sank. This is quite unique because there is no other grand staircase left in the world from the Olympic class liners. The elaborate design of the hotel dining room reveals more evidence of the skills and expertise of the Belfast ship workers. The ceilings, windows, light fittings and exquisite wood panelling all reflect the golden age of sea travel. It's a rare opportunity to sense what life might have been like on board the Titanic. So John, standing here is about as close as we can get to what it would have felt like inside the Titanic dining room. Absolutely, yes. We've got these incredible plasterwork ceilings, we've got stained glass, we've got all these panels. There's just so much to take in. Yes, absolutely original. Uh, obviously the first class dining room on um, Olympic was a lot larger than this. We're talking maybe probably ten times larger than this. That's enormous. I want to know more about this woodwork. Mm. It's incredible. It is. The craftsmanship here is absolutely amazing. Now, the Olympic... Um, carvings were all made at Harlan Wolf, same as the ones in Titanic. Mm -hmm. And the craftsmen spent many hours uh, working day and night to, to produce all this marvellous workmanship. Peary knew that this was the best way to attract big spending clients. John, I can tell from looking at this woodwork 
that they were working towards a very demanding clientele. Absolutely, this is first class pilot at its very best in the height of 1911, 1912. And no detail is spared. Tell me about this light fitting here. It's bronze? These are absolutely original to the ship. Yes, they are bronze. Um, there was hundreds of these on board. And of course, state of the art because they are electric. Yes, they are. Yes, Beautiful. They are. Every detail of the room was themed, a clue to its function. I'll bring this to your attention. Um, we have some musical notes up here and symbols and a piece of paperwork all carved into the woodwork. On... That's a music book that's over. Yes, absolutely. And it's all hand-carved uh, by those work workmen in the Hammond and Wolf. That's incredible. That's and so the, whole, the whole room is music oriented. Uh, we have guitars. And... So it's a room that was used for entertainment. Very much so. all so. these symbols of entertainment although, and yes, enjoyment. Absolutely. This room, although apart from being used as a first-class dining room, was also used for dancing and for music. I mean, this really demonstrates to me the level of detail that went into this room. And it's absolutely staggering when you think about the number of people that would have had to have been working on a room like this to produce this level of detail. John has a unique collection of memorabilia and artifacts from both the Olympic and the Titanic. Again, these relics reveal an outstanding level of craftsmanship and dedication. When I see the level of detail that went into the interior of ships like the Titanic, it gives me a sense of actually the scale of the workforce that would have been involved in the interiors. The craftsmen, metalwork, the glassware, the china, every detail down to the door handles. And that really shows me how important the Titanic was for Belfast and how it helped build the city, which was buzzing with activity and master craftsmen. At 8 o'clock on the evening of the 2nd of April, 1912, the Titanic left Belfast. She was bound for Southampton, where she collected provisions, crew and passengers for her maiden transatlantic voyage. On Wednesday the 10th of April 1912, when that voyage began, she sailed with the aspirations and ambitions of a generation. Just five days later, optimism was replaced by shock and grief as news broke that the Titanic, the greatest of all ships, was lost. On the 2nd of April 1912, the Titanic set sail from Belfast on the first stage of her maiden voyage. It had taken four years to realize Lord Pirrie's dream to build a new flagship for the White Star Line. Thousands of Belfast ship workers had built her plate by plate, rivet by rivet. They knew every bolt, every shaft, fixture and fitting of the great ship, and they were fiercely proud of their achievement. It was a magnificent piece of work by the shipyard men of those days to build the biggest moving thing in the world at that time. Yeah. Brilliant job, actually a brilliant job by the workmen. On the 10th of April, the Titanic cast off from Southampton, bound for New York. She was the largest and most luxurious ship the world had ever seen. A unique piece of engineering. More than 1,300 passengers and 885 crew were aboard. Among them was the chief designer of the Titanic, Thomas Andrews. He brought with him nine key workers from the shipyard, known as the Guarantee Group. I mean, what was the Guarantee Group? The Guarantee Group were a very special group of men who would have gone on the maiden voyage of each ship, and they would have been the best that the, the yard had in the time. So they would have been hand-picked, and the competition to go on board the maiden voyage of any ship would have been highly fought over and once you knew you were awarded it your family and everything would have been very proud so these men joined Thomas Andrews on board Titanic to deal with any little problems that came up Disaster struck just a few days into the voyage perhaps the most notorious incident in maritime history Late on the night of the 14th of April a collision with an iceberg caused immediate and irreparable damage. The Titanic sank in just three hours. More than 1,500 people perished. As the news travelled back across the Atlantic, the city of Belfast went into shock. So there were thousands of people who worked on this project. It took years. There was an incredible amount of skill that went into it. So 
for the people in Belfast and the people who worked on the ship especially, it must have been devastating when the ship went down. That is true. It was devastating and it was unbelievable. Uh, we heard about the shipyard workers who, who broke down and cried at the fact that this ship that they had just sent away so few days before had sunk and all those people had died. In fact, it was never talked about in Belfast again for many, many years. The Titanic's chief designer, Thomas Andrews, was among the dead. So were the nine men of the Guarantee Group. The shipyard was closed for a single day of mourning. But the impact of the loss ran much deeper. The golden age of the great transatlantic liners was over. It was felt by Belfast very, very much. In fact, all these things that we have been talking about, the biggest uh, gantry, the biggest slipway, the biggest dry dock, they were never used again for the purpose for which they had been built. For Harland and Wolfe, the sinking of the Titanic was the beginning of a decline. During the First World War, the yard continued to build ships, but the slipways and gantries made for the Titanic were never to see work on that scale again. Rupert Kayser has discovered one last relic of the shipyard's golden age. This small, almost derelict vessel was, until recently, lying forgotten in a harbour in France. It's called the Nomadic. It was her job to ferry first-class passengers from continental Europe to the harbour where they'd board the Titanic. Of all the ships built by Harland and Wolfe during the glory days of the early 20th century, the Nomadic is the only one that remains. A team of volunteers intend to restore her to her original grandeur. Local historian Stephen Cameron explains to Rupert why the return of the nomadic is so important to the people of Belfast. The same steel, the same material, the same rivets that are in this ship were also in Titanic as well. She's come home to Belfast, to the place where she was born, to the home of Titanic, and that's where she should be. And it's fantastic to have her back here in Belfast. The Nomadic remains the last surviving link with the Titanic and Belfast's great era of shipbuilding. Nothing on the scale of the Titanic and her sister ships had ever been attempted before. It was the greatest engineering project of its time. What's really impressed me is the sheer array of skills needed to build such a vessel. The parts needed to create Titanic, they range from some of the smallest ones like rivets up to frames which were 80, 90 feet in length, plates that were 30 foot in length. All this amazing amount of material, all individually crafted, put together by hand to create the world's most luxurious ship. What I've learned on my journey to rediscover the lost world of the Titanic is not only that White Star Lines built the most magnificent ocean liner the world had ever seen, but that they brought in an infrastructure into this booming city of Belfast. So not only did they build a huge shipyard, a community was being built as well around the shipyards, and that there were thousands of people, master craftsmen, shipyard workers, who were coming to the city to build this magnificent ship. Although it ended in disaster and tragedy, the story of the Titanic is also one of skill, dedication, and extraordinary achievement. Including unseen footage from the classic 1969 film, we tell the true story of the Battle of Britain next on the History Channel as the country readies itself for the Luftwaffe.